And once we had our oldest son, Mac, that really thrust forward our desires to know where our food came from. And he turns 14 this year, and there are still things we are learning about and growing in because it's a never ending process. We are lifelong learners. We always want to be learning and doing something mm -hmm. new. To stop learning, to stop trying new things is just a soul death that I have mm -hmm. no desire <laughs> to experience. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today, I'm having on Kate from Venison for Dinner. She's been on this podcast before. She's also a real life friend and I ask her my cheese questions. We talk about kids and how we do as a fellow business owner. So we're both moms who have content creation businesses, YouTube, blogging, Instagram courses. And we have very similar lifestyles. When you find a friend like that, you know, there's not very many people in your life that can relate to the dynamics of that. And so she's become a, a real life friend. Today, we're going to talk about cheese making and, and home dairy, but then we're also going to talk about some of that stuff, like the the business. And some of you are curious. And in the interview, we're, we talk about how it's not for everyone. And that is something I definitely want to give you permission to you know, a lot of times it's just because we can, you know, we all have access to the internet. It's like we think that we all should have a YouTube channel. We should all have a blog. And that is just not the case. It is not for everyone. But anyways, we are going to be talking about that too. Just because if we were to go meet up for coffee, if she didn't live up in Canada, I'm sure that is where the conversation would lead. Mom life, business life, how that all works. So let's dive into the interview. Well, thank you so much, Kate, for joining me. I'm excited to have you back on. This time we're going to talk more about something that is currently very interesting to me, and that is home dairy and all the things that I'm constantly texting you and referring to your course about. So that should be fun. Let's start by just introducing yourself for those who don't know you. I'm sure most in my audience already do. But yeah, tell us about you and your family and what you offer. Sure. So I'm Kate from Venison for Dinner, and I live in northern British Columbia, Canada. I have five kids, and my husband and I both work for Venison for Dinner, so we're both at home with our kids all the time. And we homeschool, and we homestead, and homesteading for us started as we wanted to eat good food, and we couldn't afford to buy it. So we decided to try raising it ourselves, and while I'm not sure that always saves us money... There's the connection that you can't deny to your food. You know, you can't deny that connection to your food when you grow it yourself. It's so satisfying. Yeah. So I have venisonfornitter.com where I do raw dairy and sourdough and wild game and all things homemade and real food. And I also hang out a lot on Instagram where I'm, I'm not afraid to say things that might ruffle feathers. When it comes to food and parenting and homesteading and... That's that's the place to find me if you like hanging out over there. Cool. Yeah. And as far as it being cheaper, that's always a question people always have. And I'm sure there are definitely ways that you can make it cheaper. But for me, it's also just availability. There's so many things that I can't get locally. I can't find them unless I do them myself or at least not in the quantity that I want them for my family. And so that to me, just having the source is more important for me than even the, you know, whether or not it's cheaper because quality food, you just can't really compare it. So yeah. Okay. So let's talk first about how you got started. Did you grow up on a farm? Did you always want to have a dairy cow and make your own cheese and be known as the cheese lady? Or how did that evolve? So I was always really into raising livestock. I grew up in a family that was one generation removed from farming. So my grandparents farmed for a living. They still had most of the land and infrastructure, but no one in my parents' generation farmed. 
but I had the support and the knowledge from my grandparents. So when I was in my teens and I wanted to get different livestock, my parents were a little hesitant to start, but because we owned a chunk of land that had one of my grandparents' barns on it and we had fencing, we already had all the infrastructure and they were like, you know what? Sure, let's go for it. Especially since we had my grandparents next door who could answer questions and help us out. So I'm really fortunate that for the first, so until 2015, I had the support of my maternal grandfather, who I called Papa, who, you know, wasn't afraid to, like very, because he was older, a lot of it was romanticized, but that's okay with me. That kept me going. And when I met Marius, my husband, he grew up homesteading from a different point of view. For them, it was about, uh, it was like sustenance because they were very poor. And if they didn't grow food, they were going to struggle. So Marius and I both had that common desire of growing food. And once we had our oldest son, Mac, that really thrust forward our desires to know where our food came from. And he turns 14 this year. And there are still things we are learning about and growing in because it's a never ending process. We are lifelong learners. We always want to be learning and doing something Mm -hmm. new to not learn, like to stop learning, to stop trying new things is just a soul death that I have Mm -hmm. no desire (laughs) to experience. Yeah. You strike me as a type of person who, when you want to figure something out, you don't have a lot of fear in going for that. That's something a lot of people struggle with. I've struggled with it with certain things to have the confidence to try something that you just simply don't do. Like there are just, I don't know, even getting a dairy cow, people have so many hesitations about it. It's just not normal to have a dairy cow. What has been, have you always been that way? Or is that a personality thing? Or is it just been, well, when I've tried certain things, I'm able to get past it. And so now I'm more confident to try other things. You know, that country song that I think it's called, I'm going to fly. And it's like, confident and cocky man it really got me when I heard my daddy say (laughs) like that confident and cocky like that I've had to like learn to like tamp that down a bit and my oldest is the same way and I'm like man you got to learn when to not speak so it's natural like learn from my mistakes (laughs) you got it's it's inborn in me like when I was three or four my mom said she would just repeat to herself the traits that are difficult in a three or four year old are prized in an adult to be independent, to have new ideas, to be confident yep. is very hard. I have one like that. I'm like, this is going to pay yeah, off. Yeah, but it's going to pay off when she's <laughs> an adult. So my mom and my parents fostered that. My mom knew that that was, you know, not a bad trait, just a hard trait as a child. And she always told me that too. So I've taken that into my parenting as well when I have kids that, mm-hmm. you know, will say different things or do different things and you're like, kind of cringing a bit because it's almost awkward when it's a child, but you're like, when they're an adult, this is going to be great. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it is. And so, I mean, I know because I have a similar personality, like I, I've been told, okay, you're fearless. Like you just go for stuff. And it, it never really occurs to me that I wouldn't be able to do it. But for those who don't have that personality trait, there is a certain level that it's been built too, because there have been definitely things that I've been scared of that I haven't tried for many, many years because I, I have thought about the failure and thought about, you know, what's, what's going to happen if I fail. And then little by little, whenever you do certain things and, and if you are able to push past the part where you're learning something, you're, you're able to be like, you know what, that, that wasn't so bad. So I can, I can see how it could be both natural and easy for some people, but then also built if not the case. I think for me, it's not about fear, but overwhelm. I, I, it takes me time to be able to wrap my head around a new process. And that was cheese making for me. So when we first got a milk cow, I didn't mm-hmm. make cheese. We yeah. just attempted to <laughs> drink it all. Marius gained about 20 pounds. Right. Um, <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> He would Mm -hmm. bring milk to work with him and him and his coworker would to try and go through all the milk. Yeah. 
So my mom started making cheese. She was called the cheese whiz. And she would make a wheel of cheese a week. And that was really helpful. She was very sciencey about it, though. She, like, very much had to follow the recipe. And it wasn't until 2013, so my second child was a baby, there was this workshop at a farm, but it was too expensive for me to attend. It was like $300 for the weekend. And that was not going to happen for us. You know, we were a young family. Like at that point, if 2013, I was 21 with two small children and my husband working, you know, like a beginner carpentry job. So there was no $300 for a weekend course. Right. So I reached out to the guy because there was like a little bio with his website. And I was like, I'm just going to reach out to him. So I reached out to him and I was like, would you ever come and do a workshop for us? Because we had two milk cows. We had a herd share. Would you come and teach us cheese making? And he was like, yes, I would love to do that. And that's David Asher of The Art of Natural Cheese Making. So that was before he wrote that book. Oh, so wow. Yeah. He has been a friend of ours for a long time. He milked our cow to have milk to write that book because for all the photos and everything. Oh, wow. So we've had a long-term relationship with with David. We call him David. David. That's what he was called growing up. Okay. David. Uh, he's Jewish. So he comes from a Jewish family. So David got me going in cheese making in a more intuitive way because the sciencey way didn't resonate with me. Right, right. But even at that, I was trying to wax cheeses and that sort of thing. And that was really frustrating for me. And then there was about a five year break where we didn't have milk cows because of where we lived and life circumstances and everything. And then in 2019, we got a milk cow again and I had seen people vacuum sealing cheeses. So I decided that I was going to try vacuum sealing cheeses and that was life changing for me because no longer did I have to worry about the humidity of where I was storing the cheese because if it's too dry or like I was trying to wax with beeswax and things like this because I didn't want to use the paraffin waxes and I was I was seeking a purest direction that was not sustainable for a mom with young kids. There has to be some moderation. Yeah. Yeah, so with the things that you've tried over the years, and cheese has been one that was the same for me, where it was the overwhelm in my mind. I guess I I was sort of fear, fearful of wasting the milk, but at the same time, I mean, whenever you're getting gallons and gallons a day, it's really not that big of a deal. You're going to waste it anyways. So I really wasn't <laughs> as worried about that as I was like the entire setup, like what tools do I need? What supplies are absolutely necessary? Mm-hmm. I don't have you know, anything at this point to start the cheese. But once I made it, you know, I don't even know, maybe like two or three times, I felt very comfortable with the process and felt like I could make cheese like regularly as a part of my life, which I didn't see before. How did that, did you have small children? You did have small children when you started making cheese. Yeah. And I know that you have a bunch of small kids now and in your course it's like kids are in and out because that's just life (laughs) how does it fit in with your with your lifestyle and we're gonna have like a QA and a here coming up um i have lots of questions from um instagram followers that want to ask you questions about this how does that i guess broadly that's a pretty big question but how does that fit in with your lifestyle and maybe it's just the answer is somewhere along the lines of once you know what you're doing it's really not that time consuming. If you're someone who enjoys the process, if you enjoy making things with your hand, like someone like you, Lisa, you love sourdough. Your love of sourdough is so evident. You love to grind the grains. You love to, you know, make the dough. And I feel like that transfers into cheese making. You milk the cow, you make the cheese. It's a hands-on process that is so ancestral that it feels so right to do it. Like a friend of mine just started making cheese a week ago. She's been milking her cow for a couple months and she finally got into it. And she was like, I cried when I took my wheel out of the press. She was like, this feels like I'm just connecting with my grandparents. Like I've done something that humans have been doing forever. Like making cheese is the way to preserve milk. People say, oh, you can freeze milk. You can can milk. No, you can't. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea? Like sometimes I'm getting 10 gallons of milk a day. Like you would need chest freezers. You would need to can all day, every well, day. Yeah. Like, 
Cheese is the way to preserve milk. Well, and it's just creating the same product just down the road. Yeah. So like down the road, still all you have is milk, which yeah. is great, but you already probably have milk. Like I'm like, at what point am I not going to have milk? Yeah. <laughs> so I need, I need a different product. Like we use cheese. Yeah. I find that with fresh cheeses too. Like, yeah, you can easily make a pile of cream cheese, but like how much cream cheese are you actually going to use? And it only lasts so long. Like it's right. Wheels of cheese, the longer they wait, you mm-hmm. wait to eat them, the better they get. Right. Yes. I love that because yeah, I've made like so much ricotta that I've, that's gone bad because I make it and then I don't realize that we have to actually eat it within like three days before it starts smelling sour. So there just isn't an alternative for that. If you are having a, if you have a dairy cow, the exception would be, of course, if you're, if you're exclusively calf sharing, then you don't get enough milk to need to do that. But if you are you know, milking the cow, getting gallons a day, there's just really no other way for it not to become overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Are you interested in starting a blogging business to support you on your homestead or in your simple living journey, or not even for an income, but just to share things that you've been learning with maybe family and friends? I have a one hour blog masterclass where I go over all the things that I wish I'd known when I started years ago that would have helped me to be successful a lot faster. The blogging world has totally changed. In fact, a lot of people actually think that blogging is dead because they've noticed that the journal style blogging has been replaced by Instagram and YouTube where people share their real lives there. Blogging is as good of an opportunity as ever. It's actually the most passive way that I make an income in my business. I have several different ways that we make an income with our business, but blogging is the most passive and it's actually the best income stream. So if I had to give up all of my income streams except one, blogging would be the one that I would choose. I I love a lot of them. I obviously love podcasting. I love YouTube. But if I could only choose one, it would be blogging. If that's interesting to you or even just you're curious, how is blogging still a thing? And you want to learn for an hour in my masterclass. It's completely free. You can get that at bit.ly forward slash farmhouse blogging school. That's all one word, no spaces and all lowercase. Again, bit.ly forward slash farmhouse blogging school to get my free one hour blogging masterclass. So one of the other questions I had for you was what are some of the fails that you've had that you've learned along the way? I will say... God bless the pigs. They eat all the things I mess up. I I can't tell you how many things I've messed up. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, cheeses that, like, I make about a seven to eight gallon wheel of cheese at a time. That's the size of my biggest cheese pot, and I find that's an easy size to handle for me. Any bigger, and it wouldn't be great. Smaller, and I feel like I'm wasting my time. I was making this big pot of cheese, and Marius was making soup, and he, like crushes the garlic in and broth is like bloop and goes into my cheese pot. I kept making it. I should have just chucked it to the pigs right then. I kept making it and it didn't immediately show up as contamination, but like two or three days later, you could tell that wheel of cheese was not right. But of course I just kept going and I'd already made another wheel of cheese since then. And I hadn't sanitized everything in between because I didn't think about that being contaminated. So then that wheel of cheese was also bad because when you get a bad wheel of cheese, you got to work backwards. You got to sanitize your cheese press. You got to boil your cheesecloth. You got to sanitize your cheese pot. And I know a lot of people will do like boiling water and this and that. Friends, a bottle of diluted bleach is so easy. <laughs> and I don't use lots of bleach in my life, but it is so easy to spray it, let it sit a few minutes, and then rinse. So... You can buy non-chlorine bleaches if the chlorine's what bother you, but mm-hmm. for sanitizing something of like that, I just find that bleach is so easy. I just finished filming a video all about cheese contamination, and if you're having persistent issues with cheese making, how to start back at the source with the cow and ste- how you take steps forward to f- to isolate where your contamination is coming from. Yeah. Cool. Well, so far, I haven't had any issues. I've made lots of cheese, but we also have only tried maybe three wheels. 
And I think all of them I've tried too soon. Some of them have been around the four to six week mark that I've tried them. But so far, I just don't love the taste of the cheeses I've made. Is that just the time or is it just like maybe I did something wrong with the recipe? So what recipe and what culture are you using? Okay, so I think the ones that I've tried, because correct me if I'm wrong, are the faster aging cheeses, the ones with yogurt whey, because I believe the ones that I've tried were the butter cheese and the yeah. Asiago. And I yeah. think both of those were the yogurt whey. So okay. I'm assuming that those just maybe like, maybe I need so to let them go longer. What do you feel like the texture is? Do you feel like the texture is still like a little rubbery? Yeah, I feel like the texture is actually pretty good. It just, and maybe my expectations of what, like, I know with so many things, whenever you make them homemade, you need to get used to a different taste that you're not yet used to. It's like you were telling me with cream cheese. Homemade cream cheese, you can't make store-bought cream cheese at home because of all the crap they put in it. And so it's not actually possible to have that same taste and you just have to get used to it. And I know this was sourdough. People are like, how do I make it not sour? I'm like, it's sourdough bread. Like it's, it is going to have a different taste than your fluffy, mm -hmm. enriched, all of the stabilizers and, you know, dough enhancers or whatever bread. And so maybe that's my, maybe that's it. I yeah. need to get used to the taste of it. I think they probably just need more time because if you're wanting a more flavorful cheese, they're just going to yeah. take more time. If you're finding that your cheese is a little like rubbery or too chewy, that just needs more time for the cheese to do its thing. Like I opened up a wheel of cheese the other day that I made in January. So it's maybe not January, March. Like it was at least a few months old and I tried it and we had friends over and they tried it and they were like, oh, that's good. I was like, no, it needs longer. I'm like, see how it's got that like bit of a texture to it? That needs longer. And they were like, oh, that's what we're missing in our cheese making. We're eating too many cheeses when they still have that texture thinking that's what it is. Like, no, you need to leave them longer okay. if you have that bit of that, yeah. like, chewy or rubbery texture to them. They just need longer. Yeah. And there's a lot of factors there, like the protein in your milk and the fat in your milk. And when you're making cheese with only... Are you doing one or two cows right now? We're just doing one cow now. But at the time we were doing two. The, and the first wheel of cheese I made was in late April. Okay. So you, you can tell we're not very far removed yeah. at all. And this has been weeks yeah. ago that I tried it. So when you're making cheese with only one or two or three cows milk, you're very niche because the protein in their milk and the mm -hmm. fat in their milk and the caseins in their milk these all contribute to what the end product is. And when you're working with like 100 cows milk, they kind of level each other out. But when you're working with only one or two cows milk, they're very niche. Right. So you learn how your cow, mm -hmm. and it actually it can be kind of messed with your mind a bit because you, you got it like nailed down and then you get a new cow and you're like, this milk acts totally different. And now like a friend of mine, we could not make mozzarella with her cow's milk. We tried so hard and it broke my brain. Yep. I have a cow that I could not make mozzarella with. Not my Jersey, but my other one. And she just gave, she was like, that's fine. I don't need to make mozzarella. She got into making wheels of cheese and that was, she's, I, her and I, we, most people I know actually prefer to make a wheel of cheese than mozzarella once you learn to make a wheel of cheese. So then she did that, but then she got a new cow down the road and she sends me a picture yes, of this I big agree. stretch of mozzarella. She was like, hey, look. Yep. And it's just some cows, the pH and the protein and the casein just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had the same experience with one of my cows. I noticed I was trying to always make mozzarella with hers because I don't, I didn't love the taste of her milk, whereas I loved the other ones. So I was like, well, I'll just use hers for mozzarella. Never worked. Every time I used the other cows, worked great. And I'm like, so clearly I'm not always doing something wrong whenever I'm using her milk. There's something different about her milk. And I will also completely agree that I thought mm -hmm. mozzarella was the easy cheese until I made wheels of cheese. And not that, not that the process, I mean, there's more tools and steps involved, but overall, I feel like I've never had a fail with it. Not saying I can't, but it's very straightforward process. Whereas like the mozzarella I've had go wrong more often than mm -hmm. a wheel of cheese. So I'll agree with that, that yeah. I thought it was such a beginner cheese till I tried it. And when you're making cheese because you're trying to deal with milk, not because like I want to make pizza tonight, it just, 
it feels better to just like make that wheel and then vacuum seal and tuck it in the fridge and just know that the longer you leave it, the better it gets versus like now it's in the freezer and it's at the best and now it's just downhill from there and it's just a year later like, oh, look, here's a bag of shredded mozzarella that's kind of freezer burnt. Right. Yeah. And usually too with mozzarella, I am making it because I want it that day. I want to make pizza tonight. That's why we're making mozzarella, which I'll still, I'll still do. But I do find that the process fits a little bit more easily with the, with the wheels because there's so many steps where there's nothing in between. Like I know that I can get this going, go do this thing, which you talked about a lot in your course that, you know, okay, now I'm going to go do this or that with a friend, or I have to do this outside or whatever. And there's so many spots throughout the cheese making process that you have time to do a lot of stuff, which is how you figure out how to fit it in. I think the best way to get started in cheese making is to just go for it. Accept that you're going to have mistakes and that you're not going to necessarily make it perfect the first time. But even if it's not perfect the first time, rarely is it actually a waste. So my mom developed this mentality and this joke where like if you made mozzarella and you botched it, so maybe it didn't stretch or something like that, it's botched mozzarella, so it's bozzarella. So maybe she made Gouda and she like heated it too hot or something like that and she botched it, it became Buddha. (laughs) So maybe you can't use it how you originally thought you would be able to, But maybe you can mix it with another cheese and put it on nachos or you can put it in a lasagna or maybe it turns out to be like one of the best ones you ever made. Like I made this one wheel of cheese that I was like, oh, I messed that up and I pressed it funny. Like my press even like went like this. The cheese was like this shaped on top. Like it was like, sorry, if someone's listening, it was like a 45 degree angle on top. I vacuum sealed that thing, threw it in the fridge. I was like, whatever. And like a year later, right. I was like, here, let's try this. And Marius is like, this is one of the best cheeses you've ever made. And I was like, well, I heavily messed that wheel up. <laughs> and I have no idea how I did. And I just decided to vacuum seal it and forget about it. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. All of the mozzarellas that I was telling you that that one cow made that was so bad, we still used all of it. It just wasn't, we just like plopped it onto the pizza or whatever I was making. It wasn't stretchy. It didn't make form a nice ball but it still melted. And actually we did do nachos too. I'd mix it with some other cheese, did nachos. None of it got thrown away. It just didn't do like what it was supposed to do. So you're right. Like if you just start and, you know, just make it, it almost always turns out. So do you have a masterclass? Like I know you have your course because I'm in your course, but do you have a, the masterclass? I just, I just launched a masterclass. And it's called Homemade Dairy Without the BS. It's for the DIYer who's fed up with their grocery bill. So it could be that you have a milk cow. It could be that you have a herd share. It could be that you like to find on-sale dairy at the store and you want to do things with it, right? You know, the clearance dairy. What could I do with it? The course goes through how we got started in cows, how we were given our first milk cow, and it goes over the story of that. We were dating and we were given a milk cow. So then (laughs) it goes over some basic milk cow care and some things to think about with a milk cow. And then it goes into uh, how we make all the different dairy products other than cheese. Because cheese making is covered in my course. I have a free cheese making course called Clabber Culture without the BS. And that is... Uh, if you're into natural cultures and sourdough and fermenting and you want to get into cheese making, Clabber will feel very right for you because Clabber is in that same line of natural fermentation and processes. And then I have a paid cheese making course as well that has a lot more recipes to it. Cool. So yeah, we will link those in the show notes in the description box so that if, or are they on your website? Pretty accessible. They are. If you go to venisonfordinner.com, that... Masterclass is, it's only like a couple boxes down on the front page. Okay, cool. Yeah, so they will also be linked below, but if anybody wants to just go straight over and figure it out, it's over at venisonfordinner.com. And I remember whenever you were first telling me about Clabber, this was before I really even understood like the process of cheese making. I mean, honestly, I didn't even know like what I would be doing, so I couldn't quite understand 
what you meant about it. And now I understand it. So if you're feeling like, okay, that's cool. After you dive in a little bit, you will understand like what she's even talking about with <laughs> using the the natural cultures for it. So it's fairly straightforward once you uh, figure out what's what's going on. Let's, Should we hop into those Instagram questions? I have the list up as well. Yes, I was thinking the same thing. Let's dive into some of them. I don't think we're going to get to all of them. But yeah, let's dive into some of them. What people wanted to hear from you. No, there's like 30 yeah. questions here. Yeah, there's a bunch. Okay, so someone says I'm getting star- I'm getting six gallons of milk a day and I don't have time to make cheese every day. We do feed hogs, but how do you stay on top of all this milk without drowning in it? I think upscale the size in which you are making cheese. So if you're getting six gallons of milk a day, then you should be making probably like an eight gallon wheel of cheese at Mm -hmm. a time. So then I would bounce between, I would put milk in buckets. Like I buy three and a half gallon food grade buckets from Uline. So sometimes I just put the milk in those and then I can just skim the cream off so easily to become butter. And then the milk's already in a bucket to go feed the pigs and chickens with. So that streamlines my process. I call that the redneck cream separator. (laughs) (laughs) And if you're getting lots of milk, I would also consider things like, are you going to be getting six gallons a day for a long time? Do you want to raise a bottle cap? That would take two gallons of your milk a day for four months. So that, you know, but that's a commitment. You have to think of how long am I going to be in this much milk? Do I want to take on a bottle cap? Do I want to take on the chore of a bottle cap? Do you have a kid old enough who could take on that chore? We mix our chickens feed with it, but definitely upscale the amount of milk you can handle at one time so that you're making the best use of your time. Because I also don't have time to make cheese every day. And last summer I was getting 12 gallons of milk a day. Wow. That's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. I straight up started watering the garden with it. (laughs) Yeah. Like I would skim the cream off and then I would water down the milk. And I would water our gardens with it because raw milk's actually a natural insecticide. It's a fertilizer. It's got calcium for like, you know, Tomatoes, blossom yeah. formation. I was overwhelmed with how much milk there is. And Marius was like, just feed the fertility of our land, Kate. Like, you know, you're kind of maxed out on how on everything else is getting way in milk and everything. And we all our pigs and chickens were getting as much as they could. And we still had milk left over. So we just fed the fertility of our gardens and that's never a waste to feed the fertility of your soil. Right, right. Yeah, that helps put it into perspective because that can feel like, it's like a good problem to have, but it can feel overwhelming to the point where I've seen people say, I stopped doing dairy cow because I couldn't take the amount of milk. It's like, well, ultimately Mm -hmm. you don't have to use it all. No, and if you follow Mountain Dog Farm on Instagram, she actually quite often does this thing where she milks, like today she milks for the pigs, Tomorrow she milks for the house. Like she just goes back and forth. She milks straight into a feed bucket. She doesn't wash the cow unless she needs to because the cow's too dirty to put your hands on. She just milks straight into a feed bucket and feeds it to the pigs. She's got young kids. She lives off grid. She just bounces between one day it goes to the pigs, one day it goes to her. Yeah. Yep. That's a good, a good thing to at least wrap your brain around it because it's, it's funny because I'm, I'm also like, I don't like wasting food. And what's funny is I'm totally okay with like raising a calf that, you know, you're going to sell and maybe not even get like my last calf we sold for $500. Ultimately, we could not find someone who wanted to take her. Anyways, this was when she was 18 months old. So this was like way beyond. And it was okay when she was taking the milk at 18 months old. But then when I have it in my possession, it's like, I don't want to waste this, which is like, well, that doesn't really make any sense why I can like be okay with it there, but not okay with it when it comes to like raising an 18 month old Mm -hmm. calf, which is not what you do with your dairy cow. Although last summer we weaned our heifer (laughs) calf at six months old because we feed the milk till six months, which is longer than the dairy standard. But we weaned her and then like a week or two later, my oldest was like, mom. We're drowning in milk. Can we please just start feeding that calf again? Yeah. He's the one who feeds the calves anyways. And we were already feeding another one that I was like, oh, sure. So we just went back to feeding her milk again. Yeah. Well, and that's totally fine. It's just weird. Like mentally, I was okay with wasting the milk kind of in that way because the calf would have been fine without the milk. So in a sense, you're wasting Mm -hmm. it. But then I'm not okay with like watering the garden with it, you know. And sometimes it's just like, okay, this abundance is actually not a bad thing. 
a friend of mine told me that she just had to adopt an abundance mindset about it. She was like, there's going to be more milk tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Okay. So some of the other home dairy questions. Is it cost effective to rate or to make your own cheese when you don't have a cow and you have to buy milk? Can you make it with store-bought milk? And then, of course, there's always the safety questions. So let's start with the store-bought milk. So, yes, you can make cheese with store-bought pasteurized milk. There is a couple things you need to do differently, but I do cover that in my course because I had a friend who teaches cheese making with pasteurized milk include how to tweak my recipes, how to tweak recipes in general, the difference in them, so that you can make cheese with store-bought milk. So it depends. What are you paying for the milk? Like, it's not cheaper to make your own bread a lot of the time. Like, when you buy fresh ground grains, you bought your grain mill, all these things, it's not necessarily actually cheaper to make your own bread versus, like, buying on-sale bread at the store. But if you value and are your soul is fed by making things with your hands, then you might feel that cheese making is something that is a hobby you really enjoy. And then is it cost effective? So if you if you're buying milk from a herd share and you're paying like $15 a gallon, I can probably tell you it's not cost effective to make a wheel of cheese unless you are buying that same quality of cheese, in which case you're probably paying like $30 a pound and then maybe it is cost effective. So what is cost mm-hmm. effective yeah. is a personal decision. Yeah, because a lot of times you're not getting like you're not getting the same product. And so when you compare store bought, just pasteurized, non-organic or, you know, whatever cheese. Yeah, that's that's almost never in any way, shape or form going to be cost effective. So that's why it's such a personal decision. Okay, so with the other cheese making questions here. Do you want to go into some of those or do any of the productivity or running a business? I'm going to leave it up to you. Which which ones you want to dive into for our last, like, however, you know, 10 minutes or whatever. You know what? All that safety and everything, that can all be found on my YouTube channel. So the contamination and how to know if your cheese is bad, that video, it might be out by the time this podcast is out. Right now, it's early July. It's going to be out in July 2023. So look for that, and that will answer a lot of your safety questions. And as for aging cheese, vacuum sealing, rennets, all those sort of things, a lot of that's covered either on my YouTube channel or in my free cheese making course. So you don't, so we're just going to let, you're going to have to do some sleuthing there, but that information is all there. So let's talk on some other things. Okay. I have a YouTube cha- a, a YouTube video that's like Q&A about dairy animals and it covers things like how much space do you have and what do I wish I knew and all those sort of things. So let's go into running a business. Okay, those parenting. are always fun. I think that's what we talked about last time and people enjoy it. Even if they don't want to start a business, it's just interesting to you know hear how it works because a lot of people are puzzled with how you, know, you can have kids and get some of that stuff done. So let's see, are any of these questions intriguing to you? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So there was two that I had strong reactions to when I read them before we started recording. Okay. The first one (laughs) is how do you find time for your business with an infant? How do you schedule it when your husband has a full-time job? I have a 10 week old baby and I can barely stay on top of laundry and dishes, let alone time for a business endeavor. Don't start a business if you are that burnt out and you have a newborn and your husband works full time and you're overwhelmed. This is not your season. (laughs) That is how I feel about that. Yeah. Don't. Just don't. Yeah. You you don't have to. You you don't have to. Not everybody has to. And that's the same. How do you run a business with littles? Older kids make sense, but so hard with ages zero to two. If you only have ages zero to two and you have no support... And you're not like needing to start a business because you're at poverty level and your family needs that income to buy groceries. Don't do it. Don't stretch yourself so thin that you burn out before you even got started. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's hard with this day and age because you, anybody can start a business before you had to, you know, get the kid, put the child in childcare 
You had to find a job, apply for a job. And now anybody can do like it's all very within reach. And so with that, it becomes hard to know, should I like this is a really incredible opportunity, but does that mean that it's right for me? And the answer isn't always yes. So I think people see the fact that, you know, I have little kids and I run a business. But friends, remember, my husband is also home full time. When I started this business, he was not. He did work full time. But my oldest was nine and he was a huge help. And I worked before they got up in the morning and after they went to bed at night. And that was because I already kind of had the social following and I had a blog established, but it just wasn't making money. So I decided that I was going to treat this business like a business and not a hobby. If I wanted to make an income from it, I couldn't treat it like a hobby. So I set myself work hours and I was super freaking determined and I could not have done that long term. I did that for a year and I was able to take my hobby that like I had a blog with hundreds of recipes and I had, there was lots of things. It wasn't like I was starting from scratch, but I needed to treat this differently. And a year later, Marius was able to quit his job in carpentry and join Benison for dinner. I could not have continued doing it. Like some people would have just kept with Marius working and me working so that we had double income, right? That would have been great. When he quit his job, we took a drastic pay cut. Like for the first couple years of Venison for Dinner, we did not make very much money at all. But we knew it had the potential and we wanted, we didn't want our kids to have two full-time working parents. We had no desire for our kids to have two working parents. That was not in our goals for our family. And the only way it was going to work would be if Marius joined the business so that while we both work for the business, we're not both working at the same time. The kids always have one adult present. And for the last two years now, actually, two partial days a week, Marius's mom is here and she hangs out with the kids, helps with laundry and that sort of thing. And that is a lifesaver for us as well. Yeah. My story is similar to yours. I, we, we all like, everybody starts from scratch. Like even when you're saying you have all these recipes on your blog, at some point you put those recipes on your blog, but you did a year of craziness where you kind of burned the candle at both ends to get to the point where you wouldn't have to do that. And I did the exact same thing. I did, I would say closer to two years of, you know, having an afternoon nap time where the kids, you know, had to be quiet, late nights, early mornings, just in those margins before Luke came home. And I definitely had the same mindset. Like, well, you know, it, it, at the time it wasn't earning like, I mean, it was earning more than his job, but it wasn't like super cushy. It was just that there's no possible way to do both very long term. There was a short amount of time though of, of just doing stuff that was really hard. I mean, I don't think there's any, any way really around that, but I never wanted to do it long term and you, and you could, and then you could have two incomes, but I don't have, that's never been the desire for, for that. I think at a certain point you have to choose your hard. It was really hard to work mornings and evenings, but you know what? It was really hard for Marius to be gone 12 hours a day. Yeah. So what hard do you want? Right. And there's always that. I don't know. I think it's easy for people to see a situation where you're on the other side of that and just think, well, they already had this or they already had that. And the truth is when you started it and whenever you put in those late nights, it wasn't it wasn't easy. And so I don't want anybody to take that away from you. Like, well, you know, she probably just always had like tons of help from her kids. I don't know. We always paint these realities that it would be easier for another person to do. Going back to, you don't have to do any of this at all. Like, it's it's okay if you don't want to. But if you do and you're thinking, well, but Kate probably had this or that or whatever, that might not even be true either. So I have two thoughts on that. One is the Lazy Genius book. Have you listened or read that book? I It was recommended to me recently. So I guess I need to now that it's been recommended twice. <laughs> So I listened to that a year or two ago and I started listening to it again recently. Actually, just yesterday. (laughs) 
it's really great. It's about different systems and prioritizing what matters and not worrying about the things that don't. And one of the things she says is like, you'll see someone in the grocery store and they like look so put together and their kids are clean and in matching outfits and whatever. And you're like, oh, but she probably like, you know, has this bad habit, right? Like, I'm not saying I, I don't actually think I do that, but you know, you like try to justify, like they look perfect, but probably this is their yes, fault or whatever. Yes, exactly. Right. right? <laughs> so, you know, that way of like justifying, like, well, she can do that, but I can't do it because of X, Y, Z. And a lot of those things are very valid things. And I'm not just talking about working from home, but homesteading or cooking from scratch. And sometimes it's not, it's just not your sis, your season to do those things. Right. Yeah. But sometimes you just need to push through and figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's, it's a hard topic because there's always pushback when it comes to things like that because Everybody does have different circumstances, and so there will be things that, uh, you know this because you're on the internet, where, yeah, there are certain things you have that, you know, do make it easier, but then there's also certain things that you've, with your homestead that you've pushed for, or with your business you've pushed for, that actually you were kind of pushing uphill, but yet you still manage to get on the other side of that. And it's just really easy to think like, well, but I could see if you had this. So, you know, which is, again, like, if you don't want to do it, no big deal at all. But pr probably everybody had some kind of challenge, maybe even similar to yours when it came to starting any of these things. Mm -hmm. And I did start YouTube with a young baby, but my young baby took a bottle and slept. I wasn't able to breastfeed. Anybody could feed her and she just slept and that was different than all my other babies before that like I could have never done it with any of my other babies but her you put her to bed at night and she stayed asleep until like two in the morning so I could just work for a couple hours whereas my other babies the second I crawled out of bed you know you like unlatch yes. them and slowly <laughs> move away they'd be awake 15 minutes later yeah and and mine were all that way and I I just, I did have to, I mean, and I'm not saying like, well, not, you know, I just did it. But in, in all reality, I mean, the truth is all of my baby, I've had five, six, seven, I'm all, I'm almost about to have, and by the time this comes out, I will have had the fourth baby since starting YouTube. And they've all been co-sleeping attached babies. So I understand, like, I completely understand the struggle. And people are like, well, you have older kids. I don't give the baby to the older child late at night, you know, like I don't, no. they don't help in that way. Like, yes, they can help clean up the kitchen after lunch, which is fabulous. And they, they completely do like they do so many things, but like the baby is a hundred percent my job. And people will say that like, well, you know, mm -hmm. people with large families, their kids raise them. I'm like, I don't know what you call raising, but that is not what's going on. No, for sure. And I think it would uh, it would more be like I would give my oldest the choice. Do you want to stay in the house and take care of the baby or go weed the garden? And he'd be like, I'll take care of the baby. Like, not always, but he, you know, you get the choice. Here's two right. jobs that need to be done. What yeah. would you like to do? I'll do the other one. So I could do things like go weed the garden that that was really cup filling to me. So mentally I was in a better place than just always being like sometimes when you're nap trapped and nursing so much mentally you can struggle to have capacity yes absolutely yeah and my biggest key for with babies has always just been baby wearing and then at some point and i'm in i'm in a season right now where this probably it's easier for me because i'm not in it like at this exact moment which i will be when this comes out but at this exact moment, my youngest child is 20 months. And so he has been sleeping well for a while now. And so, yeah, mentally, like right now, I'm not in that. But I've been in that many, many times over the last several years. It's awfully cocky of you to say you're going to have the baby by the time this is out. Uh, well, when is it coming out? <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> I don't know. I actually have no idea. Oh, I have to look at my schedule. Um, let's How see. many weeks are you? I'm 38 weeks already. Oh, no, I will 100% have baby when this comes okay. out. This is coming out in August. So 
the baby will be born like, okay. I mean, at the most four weeks from now, but I've actually never had a baby that late. So I think that probably I have next yeah. week to work. I'm like looking at my schedule on my Trello board because I organize all my content that way. And I'm I'm not very good at planning super far ahead. So mm -hmm. it's just occurred to me that, okay, probably next week is my last week of work <laughs> pending, yeah, the baby. So <laughs> I'm trying to figure all that out. I mean, the day I had my last baby, I was bouncing on a yoga ball with my laptop, paying bills, making sure everything was up to date. Yeah, I don't do birth vlogs, but I have record of all the babies I've had since starting YouTube because I'm always shooting a last minute video. And with Theo, my last baby, who's 20 months, half of that last video, I'm pregnant. And then half of that last video, I'm not pregnant because I shot <laughs> like most of it while I was having contractions. And then I had the baby that night and then I laid low for like two weeks and then I shot the rest of the video. So Trust me whenever I say, like, I have 100% been in the thick of all of this through babies the whole time. <laughs> I've totally, I totally have. Yeah. I want to take a break from this episode to tell you about one of my favorite sponsors, and that is Tubes & Co. Tubes & Co. makes natural and organic skincare products that don't make you compromise on the quality. So they use ingredients that don't have anything synthetic or any of those chemicals that you find on the list of things to avoid like most products yet they actually work really great. I have a full face of Tubes & Co. makeup and of course you can go more made up by using the bronzer and the highlighter. I usually, a lot of times on my daily wear, just do the foundation, sometimes the concealer, the mascara, I absolutely love. And then I'm really into their eyebrow pencil because I'm not a makeup artist and it makes it really easy for me to do the whole eyebrow thing without really knowing what I'm doing. It has a little brush on the end and then a, a liner on the other side that's angled and makes it really easy. They also have amazing skincare products. I love their tallow balm. It's incredibly moisturizing yet uses tallow from grass-fed cows, which you wouldn't think to use tallow on your face or maybe, maybe you do now because it's got, definitely gotten more popular. But the way that it actually makes its way into your skin versus an oily based thing like a coconut oil that I've done in the past that sits on top is incredible. It works so much better than a lot of the other natural moisturizers that I've tried. Plus they have some really amazing scents. They also have cleansers, toners, the full line of, of facial care, but in an organic and natural way that you don't have to worry about what's actually in it. A lot of times, you know, we have these lists of things that we should avoid. And then whenever we look at all of our favorite products, they have them. You don't have to worry about that with Tubes & Co. It's nourishing organic ingredients very simple yet effective. I'm not a lipstick wearer, but they have beautiful lines of lipstick. So if you are someone who likes a bright, punchy lipstick, but you're worried about all of the stuff going in, they have some wonderful nourishing lipstick as well. Tubes & Co. is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners 10% off by using the code FARMHOUSE. So head on over to tubesandco.com and use the code FARMHOUSE to stock up on some organic, nourishing, amazing skincare. I want to answer this parenting one because you and I were texting about this recently. Oh, so yeah. My kids seem to need constant supervision and intervention. Do years play well independently? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> so, yes, my kids play well independently, but we live in an area where there is a lot of mm -hmm. dangers like wild dangers so we're maybe not near you know it's not like our kids are gonna run out on the street although we are near a highway we have a gate because we're right near a highway but you know there's bears there's all sorts of things that there's a certain level of helicopter parenting and needing to know where kids are so that like the toddler's not in the cow pen and the four-year-old's not in the forest on her own where there's like a mama moose with a calf, which is very dangerous. So <laughs> yeah. yes, they play well independently, but there is a level of supervision. But when I only had small children, we had a door off of our kitchen that was not the 
entryway that you would come through. And we built, Marius made a seven foot tall fence. Like it used that like deer fencing, elk fencing, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Seven foot tall with no gate to get out. And he made it like it was probably a couple thousand square foot yard. It encompassed some trees. We had a trampoline. We had toys. We had a couple garden boxes. And the only way to get in and out was through the kitchen door. Right. Yeah. And there was a big window at where I'd wash dishes and do cooking. Like this was only a, like 1100 square foot house. It was a small house. And I could see most of the yard. But even if I couldn't see the kids, I knew they couldn't get out. They had to come back in. Right. And right. that meant that I could relax. I could read a book. I could cook dinner. I could work on a blog post. I could do these things without always needing to count heads on where the kids were. Mm-hmm. That makes such a difference. We've been talking about that a lot lately. I've been talking about it with my husband, with my sister, because it has occurred to me even more lately just how set up my current house is compared to my last house. So my last house, unless the kids were in their room for a nap time or bedtime, I could not work on stuff. And I, I think now, like, why didn't we put up a fence like Mar Marius did? Like, I guess it was budget that stopped us. But thinking back now, just how much more time I would have had if outside of my kitchen window, I set up a place where kids could play while I could see them. Because, yeah, when you have small kids, there is a huge difference between a mom who has everything set up so that the kids can play independently while she does a few other things and having to constantly watch. And like at my last house, we lived really close to a busy road and we were backed by a public park. So there was literally zero like letting the kids out of your sight, even in the house. If they went out the front door, they'd be on the busy road. And so the amount of stress and counting kids I had then versus now is so different. And so it does give you, there's just really something to be said for it that I think people forget about. Like your setup is really just going to make like all the difference. And I feel like our house right now is not necessarily set up as good as it could be. And it only works because we have a lot of supervisors in our house versus young children. And right. that's the only way it works. Yeah, Like yes, we do have absolutely. a gate at the end of the driveway. You know, all the animals are fenced in. We don't have any water. Like, there's no easily accessible ponds or things ponds. like that. Right. But when I was on, I was on bed rest with the fifth baby, and it only ended up being for a couple weeks. But if it was going to be longer, we were going to have to make some sort of safe place that I could sit with the younger, the like our third and fourth children, so that I could be left alone with them. Because I couldn't be left alone with our fourth child because I couldn't run after her. Uh-huh. Yeah. And we're, we're always, whenever we ask questions of certain people, we are always completely factoring in our own life. We have our own house that has its own set of circumstances, our own property, our own husband's jobs that may be this or that, our own child who maybe the schedule is different. And so it's really even hard to answer a lot of questions like this and to weigh in on well, this is how I did it. And this is how I did it. Whenever it's, it's just everything is different and you'll have to figure out how you can make that work in your own situation. That would be just completely different in so many ways. I will say with the intervention though thing, like needing to intervene with your kids, I'm going to be like straight up and maybe a little harsh here. There are some heart issues that need to work out if your children can't play together independent to like if they don't get along well, there are some heart issues that need to be figured out between those children. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Kids, my kids play so well. Sometimes I don't even realize just how much they enjoy each other. But we had one a situation where one of our kids uh, went with my sister in law. Uh, she lives four hours away. She said, can I take him back with me for a few days and we'll meet you in exchange again and the other kid was saying like after a few days man I miss Eli it's so boring here without Eli I'm like wait you you like him I mean you play all the time but like it seems like you know it doesn't always seem that you're playing that great but 
man, he must keep things exciting for you. Mm -hmm. And my oldest will go to work for a few hours. And my 10 year old will be like riding his bike in circles, like waiting for him to come home. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, we're we're waiting because my husband and two sons have been in Alaska for eight. No. Yeah. Nine days now. And they're coming home tonight. So I'm so excited because Super just exciting. taking I mean, it it changes a few things like it's in some ways, like some things are easier with with less kids. But some things it's like, OK, you guys really they work as a unit. They they do. They play together. They entertain each other. They get games going. I mean, it's not all like it's not all perfect all the time, but it 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 really does help when kids play together. And mine most certainly do. It's not constant intervention. They do play independently, and it, it does have something to do with the number of children too. So you have five kids at home with you right now, then? Yes, I've had five since uh, this is day nine, and so and, and no husband, but we're we made it. <laughs> Okay, so here's my funny thing. When I had, like, only two kids, like, two kids was, like, super overwhelming. And then now when I have two kids, I'm like, what a break. Two children. And my sister-in-law exactly. has two kids. It's like, <laughs> yes. what do you mean? And I was like, it's exactly. just yep. so quiet in here. Even when they're little. Even because, like, a few times throughout this last week, it's been 4th of July. Like, we're recording because I'm recording ahead of time for my maternity leave. And there was two nights where... We had fireworks at different places. Like the first night we were at a family reunion and I I made it to where the older kids could stay the night with their grandma and I'd get to the next day. So that way they could watch fireworks yet I could go home and milk the cow and put to bed the five, three and one year old. And even Mm -hmm. even three little kids. I mean, I know people that just like, ah, I can't believe you said that. But like, it's so different because older kids, you know, and it's wonderful. But like, if you're an introvert, you don't get like mental time alone or anything, you know? So like, it's even somewhat simple to go home with my five, three and one year old, honestly, a couple of nights this last week and get no, them in it's bed. It's a totally early. different dynamic. Yes. It's a whole different dynamic. Like I'd get them in bed early, go out, milk the cow, turn on a podcast. And you know, it's different. Like I enjoy my whole family together, but whenever it's not like that, it just is like, you know, it's a little change of pace. And in some ways, you know, there's just... Like you get your mom time, you know? <laughs> it's that saying, a change is as good as a rest. Okay. I've never heard that saying, but oh, that really? is what I'm trying to say without saying it in a way that's like guilty. Like, you know, cause I, I don't, I, I'm so glad my husband and my other sons are coming home tonight. I'm so glad my daughters are home right now, but like just the change is always just like a little bit like, you know, tonight we're just doing stuff a little different. <laughs> yeah. And so that's something my grandma used to say, and that goes for like, Like our oldest three kids and Marius and I went ocean fishing. It was like a jam packed 36 hours. It was exhausting. We barely slept. I prayed harder than I have prayed in my life because it was very rough seas. But then like once the seas got better, I read an entire book while sitting on this boat, like on this and just looking out at the ocean and reading this book. And even though it wasn't restful, so to speak, It was good for me. There was some heavy things on my heart and my brain before going away. And I was able to just be like completely distracted from those things. And I got back and I felt lighter about those things that had been heavy. And I was able to focus on work again. So that change, while it wasn't a rest and it wasn't a break by any means, that change was as good as a rest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. That is a really good saying. I I could see that in so many ways. (laughs) That's why I love our jobs, right? Like my job is always so different. Yeah. As a content creator, it's like it's always very dynamic. It base it's based mm-hmm. on seasons, it's based on creative, it, you know, whatever I'm feeling. So, yeah. The, the whatever you're feeling is for better or worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But hey, it's a change, right? <laughs> yeah. So we have um I committed to taking the kids to water every day possible this summer, like because we're in northern BC. Like, right, you have there's to. There's snow yeah. half the year. 
Yeah. And a couple of our kids are not very confident in water and we want them to be more confident in water. And the only way to do that is to go to water. So we've basically committed to that we get everything done by four o'clock and then we go for two hours to either a river spot we like or a lake. We have like half a dozen amazing spots within a 15 minute drive. And we go and we spend a couple hours there and we come back for dinner and it's not like always a break but it's a change mm-hmm. and I bring my comfy camping chair. And even though I'm still like doling out snacks and dealing with a toddler who's right. not always super happy because he doesn't always love water, that change is as good as a rest for me. And I can come back refreshed for dinner, milking, watering the garden, all that stuff in the evening. Yes. Yes. I, I do. I have to do the exact same thing. Like we're a few hours later than you, but we're, I'm going to wrap up work soon here and we're going to probably go to the pool. We And I agree with you. Like you're still there at the pool watching toddlers and chasing them around and whatnot. But it still does feel restful when I come back home after. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I think I live my life by that without actually even knowing that saying, but I like it. <laughs> yeah. And for me, that point in the day is like the witching hour. Or my aunt would call it the arsenic hour. Like you don't know whether to give them or yourself arsenic because it can be brutal. And my sister calls it the whiskey hour. Like can't everybody have some? <laughs> the arts. And, but so that would be a time mm-hmm. in the day when I might be like, you know what? Just turn on the cartoons, just turn on the cartoons so that I can just like have a break. So instead of turning on cartoons, we're taking them to water. They're wearing out. They're... <laughs> My youngest two right. are sleeping till almost eight o'clock in the morning instead of getting up at six. If they're so and mean, yeah. that right there makes it all worth it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm always like, okay, we're gonna leave right at about three thirty in the afternoon, stay out till six thirty, bring you home so hungry, so tired, feed you and yeah. put you to bed. That is like totally my summer yeah. strategy. I love it. All right, tell us about where to best find you. I know you already mentioned Instagram, um, YouTube, your website, and then your upcoming offerings. I know you have your master class, so people can follow along. Yeah, so I'm venison for dinner everywhere. So I would love if you could come and find me. Come say hi over on Instagram. Come say hi on a YouTube video. And there's lots. There's so, there's so much. You can go down deep rabbit holes of all the content I have posted and never get tired of it. Yeah. Yep. That's right. That's what happens when you've been doing this for so long. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Make sure to go check out Kate and all of her YouTube videos. As we were like chatting, I was looking through to see, you know, what else should we talk about? And I was looking through her channel and I have so many videos that I need to catch up on in the last couple of weeks. So you can go check that out too. Venison for Dinner over on YouTube, Instagram, venisonfordinner.com. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast.